Good morning, Church on the Rock Online. It's great to have you joining us again today. I want you to know that we are, this morning, we are opening up our worship center again, and we are beginning to uh, worship in our sanctuary in Oak Harbor. And if you're ever in the area for Oak Harbor, we would love to have you join us at 1030 Sunday mornings. But we're going to continue this online format as well, because we just feel that you are precious to us, and we want to continue to minister to you. But we invite you, if you're ever in Oak Harbor, you can certainly come join us. Um, today, as we have in the past, I want you to just click down below and, and greet one another. Uh, make sure you make each other feel welcome. Introduce yourself to anyone you don't recognize. And let's let everyone really experience our love for each other through this online format. We are glad that you are here with us, and we're grateful that you are worshiping with us. We pray that you are blessed by our time together. And now as we join together, uh, join as we sing, Build My Life. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Your heart and lead me in your love to 
Psalms 39, and I will be reading the first 11 verses. My Bible has this particular psalm titled, Prayer for Wisdom and Forgiveness. I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with the muzzle, while the wicked are before me. I was mute with silence. I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadth, and my age is nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Selah. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth. Because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquities, you made his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely, every man is a vapor. Sit on. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning that we, we do have this opportunity to come before you. And we come, Lord God, with, with always that desire upon our heart. And that desire is to know all that we need to know or can know about you and to walk upright with you, Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are your humble servants. And we come before you today in need of hope. Oh Lord, there are times when we feel helpless. And there are times when we feel weak. But we pray for hope. Hope for a better future. Hope for a better life. Some say the sky is at its darkest just before the light. And, Ma, and Lord, we pray that this is true, for all seems dark. We need your light, Lord, in every way. And we pray, Father God, that you would fill us with your light from head to toe, that we may bask in your glory, to know that all is right in the world as you have planned and as you want it to be. Almighty God, give us true faith and make that faith grow in us day by day. Also give us hope and love so that we may serve our neighbors according to your will. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Father in heaven, look upon all your people who struggle, who struggle with anger, anxiety, doubt, frustration, who struggle with guilt, helplessness, loss, lack of patience. Oh, struggle with pain, regret, selfishness, temptation, and weakness. Your Holy Word tells us 
all things work for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Remind us, Father God, of your invitation. Cast all your cares upon me. And, and remind us, Father God, of the assurance that goes with it. Because I care for you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Today, Father, as we continue, as we continue th this journey we've been on with you, Lord God, we ask for your, your grace. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your patience, Lord God. Sometimes we just step out there on our own. But we know that you're still in charge. So, Father God, as we have gathered today and has come together, we ask that you would just increase in us even the more. <laughs> Your holy word, the understanding, and the blessings and favor that follow. This morning, as we prepare ourselves to continue in the book of John, we thank you, Lord God, for this time. And we thank you, Lord God, for our pastor for his family, his lovely wife. And we thank you, Lord God, for keeping all of us safe during this time. And this morning, Lord God, as we gather together, some of us pray face to face, some of us in deep thought, some of us with loving memories. We thank you, Lord. Again, bless our shepherd as he comes forth with the word of God that it will encourage and increase in us that desire to do all that we can do for you, Lord. So prepare us this morning, Father. Give us the option, the desire to go even to the last mile. We thank you, Lord. And this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In him we have salvation. Amen. Thank you, Sydney. Most of you know that when I retired from the Air Force, I spent seven years in the banking and finance industry. And I remember one morning as I was sitting at my desk in the corner of the lobby of the branch, the bank branch office, that a man walked in and he had a handgun and he walked into the lobby and began giving instructions to people. And a second man walked right by all the people standing in line and he opened that little half door that separates the tellers from the lobby, went right in, went right up to the bank vault and began to open it. And a third man walked in and he's carrying a bunch of empty bags and he went right behind the tellers and he began filling all the bags and when they were filled, he went out the back door. Now when you listen to that scenario, What's going through your mind? Let's go back and look at it again, but let me give you a little bit more detail. The man filling the bags was the branch custodian. The bags were garbage bags. And as he did each day, he would go behind the tellers, he would take the garbage, he would fill the garbage bags, he would take all of the shredded material and all of the waste and take it out. And he went out the back door because well, that's where the dumpsters were. The man who walked across the lobby, passed all the people waiting in line, right up to the vault and began opening the vault. He was the branch manager. He opened the vault every single morning as part of his normal daily duties. And the man carrying the handgun was the bank, sec the bank security guard. Context makes all the difference in the world when trying to understand a situation, doesn't it? If you had walked into the bank and let yourself in through that half door and walked up to the vault and began to go into the vault, one of the tellers would have sounded an alarm, another person would be calling 911, and you would be arrested and thrown in jail. You didn't have the authority to do what the branch manager does every single day. Today, as we look at John chapter 8, 
we're going to see that Jesus is going to clearly proclaim that he indeed has the authority to do and say everything that he has done and said so far in this gospel. So look with me at um, chapter 8 of the Gospel of John. Chapter 8 begins with Jesus doing something that if he were not God, it would be absolutely insane. He will forgive a woman caught in adultery. Who has the authority to forgive sin? Only God. And so, after he does that, then he claims to be the Messiah. He calls himself the light of the world. And he's telling each person that's listening to him that they are in darkness. And their only hope is to follow the light of the world to the promised land. They must follow him. Now, either Jesus is the Son of God, or he's utterly insane. And as we've seen previously, his siblings believe that he indeed was saint, insane until after the resurrection from the dead. That's when they realized that they had been wrong and that Jesus was indeed who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the Messiah. And so let's take a closer look at John chapter 8. I want us to read together John chapter 8 beginning with verse 1 through verse 11. Follow along if you have your Bible available. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst of they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law Moses commanded us now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? Verse six They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, from now on, sin no more. In this situation, we see that the scribes and the Pharisees are setting a trap. They want to catch Jesus doing something that they can accuse him of wrongdoing. And so they think they've got the perfect trap. They think they've found a way to trick Jesus into falling for the trap. And to understand precisely what they're doing here, we need to understand the situation and what the law required. We need to understand the approach that these people are making as they come to Jesus. You see, they had already been trying to trap Jesus. But we also find, as we read this account, that they were actively involved in trying to trap this woman. It could hardly be otherwise when you stop and realize what the demands of the Jewish law was, the Mosaic law, to condemn a person for adultery. There, you had to have witnesses, multiple witnesses, who caught the couple in the act of adultery itself. They had to have multiple people, multiple witnesses, all there at the same time, witnessing the same thing, so that when they gave their testimony, it would all agree. And so the, 
about the only way you could actually get to a place where you could substantiate a charge of adultery is if it had been a setup in the first place. And so they set this woman up, and now they bring this woman to Jesus. They bring her to Jesus, and they drop her at his feet, and they say the law of Moses says that a woman caught in, or a person caught in adultery is to be stoned to death. What do you say? So here they are bringing this person. She's guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. And they bring this to Jesus. And they think that they've got Jesus in a trap, right? They think that they've got him in a place that they will win either way. Here's why. If Jesus, they know, first of all, that Jesus is compassionate toward people that they considered sinners, that he was merciful toward them. And they also felt that Jesus was placing himself above the law. Remember in chapter 5, Jesus healed a man who was lame. He did that on the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders became angry with him and charged him with breaking the Sabbath. And so they thought he was putting himself above the law. He wasn't. He didn't break the Sabbath. He was properly interpreting the Sabbath. And he was just doing what the religious leaders should have been doing all along. He was helping people. But they said they believed in their mind that he was breaking the law. And so they devised a plan that they would hopefully get him to break the law again. He's merciful. He's compassionate toward people they considered sinners. And they were hoping that by bringing a person caught in adultery, that they would place him in a situation where it was a lose-lose. Here's how it would work. If he came, if they came and put the lady at their at his feet and said, This woman was caught in adultery, the Mosaic law requires that she be stoned to death, what do you say? If Jesus said, Let her go, forgive her sin, then they would have him for breaking the law. And they could accuse him along those lines. But if he went along with them and agreed that the law did indeed require that she be put to death and so they could stone her, but also they could discredit him as being kind, merciful, and compassionate toward sinners. And so they thought they had him in a catch-22. There was no way he could get out of this. But it's interesting because they bring this woman to the holiest man in town. They put, him, put her at his feet and ask, we've caught her red-handed. She's guilty. What do you say? Do we have your permission? Perfect trap. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't even address the law. He doesn't address the sin of the woman. He simply tells the people, the men, the religious leaders, to stone her. But he gave one condition. Let only those of you who have no sin cast the first stone. You can only carry out the judgment, the sentence, if you also are without sin. He didn't address what the law said or required. He didn't address the woman's guilt. He simply turned the tables again, which he did so well. He turned the tables. They brought the woman, accusing her of sin. He turned the tables and pointed the light back onto their sin. And now, now, if you are without sin, you may cast the first stone. 
one by one. They dropped their head in shame and left until Jesus was alone with the woman. They walked away because when you stop and think about it, only Jesus could have cast the first stone because only Jesus was without sin. But he didn't cast the stone. He didn't condemn the woman. Instead, he forgave the woman. Does no one condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. Now up to this point, Jesus had not done anything that required any special authority. And I told you at the beginning that we are going to see in this passage that Jesus is going to claim authority for everything that he has done and said up to this point in the gospel. He's going to make it very clear that he indeed has the authority to do these things and to carry out the things that he has said. Just like the branch manager, the bank manager, has the authority to go and open the vault each morning, Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Now, all Jesus had done so far is properly interpret the law. What comes next, however, demands unique authority. Jesus forgives her sin. And who is it that has authority to forgive sin? You and I can forgive someone who do things to us that are wrong and hurt us. We can forgive them for that. But that forgiveness does not take away the guilt of their having done that. Right? It doesn't make them not guilty. It just means we don't hold them accountable for that. Suppose you were in Jesus' position and you forgave this woman. And all of a sudden, the wife of the man who had committed adultery with her were to come up to you and say, By what right do you have to forgive this woman's sin? By what right did this woman sin against you? You see, we can only forgive up to a point, if somebody has done something against us, we can forgive, but we can't remove the guilt. We can forgive them, though, but we can't, we can't remove the guilt for that. We don't have that authority. Now, imagine that same angry wife walked up to Jesus and said, By what authority do you dare to forgive her of her sin? Did she sin against you? Jesus would have simply answered, yes, she did. She sinned against me. And not only did she sin against me, but I'm going to take that sin upon myself. And I will become her sin for her. And I will suffer the punishment. I will pay the price for her forgiveness for that sin. Yes, she did sin against me. See, Jesus didn't excuse her sin. He acknowledges her sin. But he also came to save sinners. Like you, like me, like this woman. And when he spoke to the woman, we hear Jesus say, she hears Jesus say something unique. She hears Jesus say, I am not like those self-righteous, hypocritical men who are only interested in condemning you. I'm not like that. I care about you. I forgive you. Now, by the power of my life, go and live a new life free from sin. She was guilty. She was ashamed. She was humiliated. And quite frankly, she was at the end of her life, literally. She had been found guilty, and the, the punishment for the sin was capital punishment, the death penalty. She was going to be executed. 
And so they group this group of men, drag her to Jesus. They throw her at, her, at his feet. She's guilty. What do you say we do? They condemn her, but Jesus forgives her. And not only does he forgive her, but he changes the course of the rest of her life. He does that not by giving her a license to continue to sin. He gives her a reason not to. That God loves her, cherishes her, and forgives her. I want each of us to understand that our sin never surprises Jesus. He took our sin upon himself when he hung on the cross. And as a result of that, he bore the price. He poured, bore the price for our sin. Every single action, every single thought, every single wrong attitude you and I have ever had, he has already paid the price for those. It's already covered. And as a result, you and I, are free from condemnation because Jesus paid it all so we can rest in his grace we can rest in his goodness we can rest in his mercy we can rest in his forgiveness hear me clearly Jesus won't stone you so stop stoning yourself you can let go of it you are forgiven you are free from the condemnation of sin so rest, rest in his grace. I want us to look at one more verse before we finish this morning. I want us to look at verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them. Now he's with the crowd. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it's more than just a powerful statement. It is a clear messianic title. When Jesus said that, the people would be reminded of what Isaiah wrote back in Isaiah 49, where the Messiah was called a light to the nations, and that he would make everything right. He would make the world correct the way it was supposed to be, and right again. But that title, Light of the World, is not just a messianic title. It also identifies Jesus as God himself. All through the Old Testament, light is associated with God. For example, Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. So it's a messianic title but it's also a divine title he's not just a messenger from god he is god he's divine and with that claim to be god comes unique authority authority to forgive sin we need to remember keep this in context with what's happened before in chapter six and seven jesus says basically reenacted the entire Israelite experience from slavery in Egypt to entering the, the promised land and all the wilderness journey in between. You see, Jesus walked across the Sea of Galilee. He miraculously traveled from one shore to the other, just like the Israelites walked from Egypt into the wilderness across the Red Sea on dry land, miraculously delivered from one shore to another. While in the wilderness, God fed them the bread of life. Well, Jesus fed 5,000 plus their families. From the lunch of a little boy, two fish and five small loaves of bread and he took that and he multiplied it and he provided a meal for all these people 
so lavish that 12 basketfuls of leftovers remained, one for each tribe of Israel. It was a miraculous feeding. Just as in the wilderness God gave the bread from heaven, Jesus comes and says, I am the bread of life. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will watch over you. I will care for you because I love you. You may remember that after Jesus fed them, the disciples got in the boat and went across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus went and prayed, and after he prayed, he walked across the water through the storm and walked across the water, uh, with, met up with the disciples in the boat and traveled to Capernaum. The next day, the people who had been fed came looking for Jesus, and they couldn't find him. They remembered that the disciples had gotten into the boat and traveled, but Jesus didn't go with them, and they were confused. So they got in boats, and they went to Capernaum as well to try to find him, and they did find him. And they asked, how did you get here? When did you get here? And so he said that you're only interested in the fact that I can give you physical food. You're not interested in me being the Messiah. You are only interested because I can give you food to meet your physical needs. And as a result, they grumbled and they complained and they demanded a sign to, so that they might have a sign with which to believe him, to believe in him. Then in chapter 7, we're in the Festival of Booths. The Festival of Booths, remember, recounts the time that Israel wandered 40 years in the wilderness. And during that time, God fed them manna from heaven, the bread of heaven. And God provided water for them. Miraculously, the pool of Mara was made sweet by throwing a log into it so that they could drink from that pool. The rock, Moses struck the rock and water poured out. Another time Moses spoke to a rock and water poured out. God provided water for them. And Jesus then comes and says, If any of you thirst, come to me and I will create in you a, a river of living water so that you'll never thirst. You'll never thirst. And then in this passage today, verse 12, I am the light of the world. I'm the light. I will guide you. Do you remember as they were walking through the wilderness experience, God guided their steps, guided where they were to go? Do you remember how he did that? He placed a pillar of cloud in front of them by day and wherever that pillar went that's where they were to follow and he put a pillar of fire in front of them at night so wherever that pillar of fire went they were to follow and they didn't know where they were going they didn't know the way to the promised land they would have wandered aimlessly and died in the desert. But God led them. God provided a path for them. He lit the path so that they could walk. All they had to do was follow him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus' authority, the same authority he was claiming in these chapters, he claims today. He tells us that we are lost in the wilderness. And the only way, our only chance to survive is to follow him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You must follow C.S. Lewis once wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. 
That's my testimony too. When I received Christ as my Savior, it was as though my life, I saw all the pieces of my life as a big jigsaw puzzle, all loose and mixed up in the box. And it didn't make any sense to me. But when I received Christ, it was as though, just like Paul, I had my eyes open and the veil lifted from my head and I could begin to make sense of the pieces of my life. And as I've lived in that relationship with God, He has helped me see the relationship of how the pieces of my life fit together. Only when I follow Jesus can I understand the pieces of my life. Only when I follow Jesus can I understand the world. Does the world make any sense? I need Jesus to be my guide. I am the light of the world, he says, and that light shines into our lives so that we are able to make sense of the world. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christian, if you have come to that place in your life where you have accepted by faith God's self, or Christ's death on the cross and his sacrifice on your behalf, then take comfort. Take comfort in this promise. Take comfort that he says he is the light of the world. Take comfort because he is telling you that he is going to guide you. He is promising that he is going to guide you. Are you confused as to what you should be doing next? Are you not sure of the next step? Are you not sure you're in the right place? Are you not sure what God wants for your life? Are you not sure? Then take comfort. Draw near to Jesus. Get into his word. Spend time in his word daily. Listening to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit and opens your mind to what he's trying to say to you through the living word of the scriptures. Go back to a time when you clearly understood uh, what God was asking you to do. And go back and make sure you're still doing that and keep doing that until he tells you to do something different. And when he tells you to start doing something different, start doing that and keep doing it regardless of the consequences. Our greatest life, our most fulfilling life, comes only when we are walking in the presence and the purpose of God. He is our only reliable guide. Let's pray. Father, we look back and we see as Jesus has taken these last few chapters, he has shown us that he is the bread of life. Just as God provided the bread of heaven, the manna to feed and care for his people Israel in the wilderness, so Jesus comes as the bread of life and says he will care and nurture and take care of us. But we need to follow. Jesus also said that he is the living water, that if anyone will come after him, he will place streams of living water flowing from their heart. Just as you provided water for the Israelites in the wilderness through the striking of the rock, or the speaking to the rock, or the uh, pool at Marah, you promise to provide for us, to satisfy our spiritual thirst. And you said that you are the light of the world, you are claiming not only to be the Messiah, that, but that you are God himself. You light our path. You direct our steps. You are our pillar of cloud by day and our pillar of fire by night. We have not walked this way before. We don't know the way to the promised land. We can only get there if we follow you. So help us to lean into you, help us to trust you, help us to cling to you, help us to draw close to you, help us to pursue you and to stay close and to follow you so that you may safely lead us to the promised land. And we will give you the praise through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Sadness 
from wherever you've been Come broken hearted, let rescue begin Come find your mercy, O oh sinner come near Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal So lay down your for joining us today at Church on the Rock Online. We pray that that message and our time of singing together, our time of worship was a blessing to you. If you've not yet come to know Christ as your Savior, I pray that the message helped draw you closer to Him. That Jesus is claiming authority as the Messiah, the Son of God, true God, the Savior of the world, come to put the world right. If you haven't come to the place where you've trusted him, I pray that you will be drawn closer to him. If you have any questions that you need uh, answered or you're just wondering about some things, put in the comment section, that's me, and I'll contact you. I'd love to talk with you further about it. I pray if you have received Christ and you're a follower of Jesus today, that you were encouraged and strengthened and uplifted, challenged, but encouraged knowing that Jesus is the light of the world and he provides the pathway, that he guides our steps, he guides the path, and he takes us safely to the promised land. I pray that you are encouraged by that, that he provides for us, he is the bread of life, he is the light of the world, he is the living water, 
and that he is here for you and that you can rest in that press close if you're wondering what it is that god wants you to do next press close to jesus get into his word listen to what he's his spirit is revealing to your heart and your spirit and move in the direction that he's telling you to move and do that regardless of consequences trust him trust him he has the most fulfilling and rewarding life possible for you when you follow him so follow him day and night press close don't let go he's got you you're safe you're forgiven you are loved you are redeemed and he holds you precious now as we close our service today i want to come back to a scripture that sydney read for us earlier this morning out of psalm 39 verse 7 and now O lord what do i wait for what do i wait my hope is in you my hope is in you father we thank you that we have you on which to build our life we can trust that you will provide for us that you will direct our path that you will be the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night guiding our every step lighting the path showing us the way that we are to walk only then can we be in secure relationship with you but we need to follow your lead help us father to let go of our wants to grasp on to your heart we thank you we praise you in the name of jesus amen thank you so much have a great week god bless you we will see you right here church on the rock online next week same time same place god bless <music>